Hello and welcome to Access Chat. I'm delighted to be back wearing a heroic beard from uh, not working for a month. Um, and I'm delighted to welcome Yoshi Kudhal, who is the guy in charge of toll work and also uh, responsible for Accessibility Club in, in Germany, a friend of one of our dear friends, Beatrice Gonzalez Mejides. So um, really glad to have you um, here on Access Chat and to be back in the saddle after a month out playing around, lounging around, doing nothing, enjoying the <laughs> sun, um, you know, drinking caipirinhas on the beach. So Hi. welcome. Hello. Nice to be here. Yeah, yeah, glad to have you. And and so can you tell us a bit about your your journey into accessibility and and, and start, because I know you do a lot, talking about you know, Accessibility Club and some of the events that you run and, and all of the, the work that you're doing, which is really great in, in Germany. Sure. Um, well, I, I, I have to begin with that I cannot really remember uh, when and how I really started uh, working on accessibility topics. Um, I'm like I'm I'm in my late forties and I started doing websites in in the mid of the nineties. So it's it's quite a long time. And um, I, I you probably know uh, that at that time there was just HTML and CSS and uh, beginning of JavaScript. And so I, I was I was really like learning it from the very beginning and with the with the most primitive. Um, building blocks and I think if you do that then you actually you cannot really work around accessibility um, so kind of this has always been part of my work but it was not the main focus until I, I can't really remember maybe 2005 2008 or something around that time so that was actually when we started to to put a little bit more focus on that and it became really uh, intense when um, we started something that was called um, an open device lab. I don't know if you know what an open device lab is, but that's um, it was kind of a kind of a community from 2013 and the following years. And a friend of mine, uh, it's Jeremy Keith from Brighton in England. Uh, he actually started uh, the first open device lab uh, by like he was he was writing on his blog something like. Oh, we've got a couple of devices in our office, and they mostly lie around, and we don't really need them. So why don't you come over and uh, and use them for testing your stuff? And um, that was actually um, the the beginning of the Open Device Lab community, and uh, we kind of uh, took note of this, and it 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 really this was actually what we were needing at that time as well. So uh, we were jumping on the train and. Uh, we we founded an open device lab here in Nuremberg, and I think we were the second or third in Germany or something. And we quickly became the biggest one um, in terms of devices and stuff. So uh, that was actually when we when we uh, when we really got in touch with uh, with a community because up until then we were just just working in our office and doing websites and stuff. So we were not really connected with the world. Um, and from that time we we were kind of connected and we. We got in touch with a couple of people, and then there was a funny accident uh, incident. There was there was a mailing list around these open device labs, and there was an, an American woman, and she posted into that mailing list, "I would like to give you some money. Someone can can apply for this money." Uh, I I think she was talking about one thousand dollars or something, which is quite a lot of money, and she wanted to give that as a donation to one of the open device labs. But um, she said, um, if you apply for this money, you have to do something um, that has something to do with accessibility. And you need to uh, tell me what you're going to do. And there should be some, some sort of long-term plan for that. And I was thinking, oh, that's, that's a nice situation. I would really love to get that money. And um, we're also a bit into accessibility. But what could we do, actually? And then I was calling a friend of mine. Um, you might know him. It's Marco Zieh, who worked for yeah. Mozilla um, until recently. And I asked him, Marco, if you if you had one thousand euros or, or dollars or whatever, um, what would you actually buy for an open device lab? What would you? Yeah, what would be nice for an open device lab? And then he said, 
Well, I probably wouldn't buy a device, um, but I would buy a screen reader license because that's actually really interesting uh, for people to come over and test yeah. with that. Yeah. Um, and I said, okay, this is great. And he, he got me in touch with, uh, with a guy. He's, he's, he's in, living in Nuremberg, actually, and he is, um, he, he's like a dealer for assistive technology. So um, he actually gave us, or he, he, he yeah, we, we got a developer's license for JAWS, actually. So that was, uh, that was the beginning of, um, well, of the official part of accessibility work we did. Because when he gave me, when he handed me over the, the license for JAWS, he said, uh, it's really nice that you've got a, a screen reader license now, but the problem is that you actually don't know how to, how to work with it. Uh, so you need some sort of training because if, if there are people coming to your office, to your open device lab and want to test with a screen reader, uh, you can't really explain what to do. So you should get training with that. And that was actually the beginning of the accessibility club because I thought he was so right. And then um, I just had the idea, okay, we could, I could gather a couple of like web designers, web developers, and just lock them in one room with him and his screen reader, and he could just show his screen reader. And that's what we did. We were like, I think, nine or 10 people. There are the photos on the Flickr I just sent you, actually. Uh, it was in 2014, and we, uh, we met at the local co-working space, really small group. And um, like the guy he was... was showing his screen reader and we actually planned to do this for one hour or two hours uh in the in the end they th threw us out at like after four hours and we <laughs> we saw that there are so many things we could we could do actually and so that was actually when the accessibility club started that was the first meetup wow. and over the years it, it it got bigger and bigger after that so we uh, we did a couple of uh, smaller events here in nuremberg then we uh, went to berlin uh, then we had, in the end, in 2018, we had a big conference there. Um, and in 2019, we had a two-day summit with conference and workshops and stuff. So it kind of grew over the years. And then came the pandemic, obviously. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we see what's going, going to happen next. So that was actually my path into, into the accessibility work. And um, I think around five years ago or something, we decided to go all in with with my agency. So uh, that was when we uh, when we started. Um, like we made a new website and and we wrote there that we're just doing accessibility stuff um, and not doing anything else any longer. Which is not really true because obviously we we still have got a background with all sorts of uh, web topics. But uh, that's like the main that's like the main theme in in the meantime. So we don't really talk about the other stuff any longer so yoshi welcome 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 to the program and i think you brought up such an important point about your accessibility club because i remember one time i was um training a client a, a large uh, healthcare client and i brought in a gentleman that worked for me at the time and his nickname was mr jaws because he was so good at the screen reader he was so good that you sort of didn't want him only to test with accessibility because he knew so many workarounds that a novice user would not know that you would have false negatives, false positives. But I remember something happened um, and something went wrong with the screen. So, uh, something went wrong with the computer. So we called in during the class. We had a full class. Um, we called in the IT guy and he came in and he took one look at the computer without a screen and was like, uh, I, I I, I have no idea how to do this. And, and then they worked together and the class watched. And it was so fascinating because in the first place we were saying, can you turn down that speaking speed? Because it was gibberish to me and to most of us, right? So what happened in trying to solve this problem on the fly in training, which happens, the education that we all got about how brilliant this man was and we should not be feeling sorry for him, we should feel sorry for ourselves that we're not as good as technologists he is. It was very powerful. But so I think something often I see left out of the conversations is the understanding of how assistive technology complements accessibility. We know um, a person that doesn't believe in ex uh, assistive technology. They think it's a scam for um, 
you know, people with disabilities, making them buy things that they don't need when all you need is an accessible website. And I keep saying, yeah, but uh, we have to navigate the computer on and then we got to navigate to the Internet and then navigate to your website. And then I don't want to turn my assistive technology off. So I just think what you're doing Marrying those together is so important to true inclusion. So uh, I just really want to compliment you on that. But do you find, has that continued in your accessibility clubs, really understanding how the people that you're trying to make sure can use your systems actually are using the computer to get to your system? So has that continued to be a very important theme? It, it it has continued. That's true. That's yeah, true. Uh, we actually the, the accessibility club uh, turned out to be not one one and the same thing all the times. It kind of changed. It, it it's it's shifting its shape from event to event. We still have smaller meetups um, and maybe having guests talking about a particular topic or something. Um, and when we have uh, bigger conferences or the summit, for example, then we have workshops. So there are people doing things or talking about a very specific topic. Um, and it kind of it kind of continued. That's true. Um, as soon as we started doing the bigger events, um, we in, in, the, in the beginning, we were kind of um, we didn't really know if we can get so many um, attendees that it really uh, pays off to have a big conference because, you know, Germany is like rather small community wise. Um, not, not comparable to, for example, the Netherlands um, or Great Britain, maybe. Um, so uh, we actually we were we were skeptical if we can have uh, a, a big crowd joining the event. So uh, we try to have um, have like some things really interesting for absolutely absolute beginners and also stuff for the experts. Uh, so we uh, we we mostly did something like a bar camp style. I, I'm sure you know what a bar camp is. So uh, with uh, with topics that people could bring themselves to the to the event. So um, that that can always be um, some some like presentations for experts, uh, and they obviously need to know uh, different things than the beginners. Uh, so what we did, for example, in Berlin in 2019, we had a an accessibility 101 session in the beginning, or actually it was it was even uh, before the the main event started. So even some some folks who really don't know anything about accessibility could come and they would get the the first like um, the first concepts and ideas of accessibility and assistive technology so we always try to teach that as well not teach but it's it's like it's a community thing so mm -hmm. um, it's not yeah so yes we try to continue this and and try to cover all sorts of topics um, it, it's not a particular thing we're doing it's always shape shifting <laughs> so uh, I know Antonio's got a question, but you, you mentioned something that is particularly of interest to me, and that is you said that the German community is quite small. Now, Germany is not a small country. You said it's smaller than the Netherlands and smaller than the UK. But I know that there is growing interest. So how do you see accessibility progressing in Germany? You know, what will it take to to really sort of expand the profession uh, and, and really get people engaged because it's, it is a huge topic. Germany's enacted laws recently around the public sector and also now for private sector with the European Accessibility Act coming into play. So there's a, a need for the skills. What do you think it will, will take to, to grow the skills and attract people to the profession in Germany? That's that's the real good question and if i knew the answer to that uh well I, I the thing is um you're right i'm seeing progress over the last couple of years that's true and um i especially i'm i'm watching like the event communities um i'm kind of involved uh, in in a couple of uh, other conferences as well or at least i knew the people uh, running these conferences and what i really like about them is that um i see that um, accessibility is is kind of being mainstreamed in the last couple of years. So um, there is, for example, the conference of a good friend of mine. Um, the conference is called Beyond Tellerrand, and uh, that's actually just a creativity and and yeah, a creativity conference. And of of 20, um, 20 talks, 
the conference has, maybe three or four in the meantime are about something, something accessibility, oh, yeah. which is which, which really changed over the last couple of years. It's it, in, in this particular case, this is also because I'm a close friend of the of the organizer and we actually, I'm always piggybacking with the accessibility club in his conference. So uh, we are running that just on the day before the conference or after the conference. And then we're kind of exchanging speakers. For example, Leonie Watson was talking at accessibility club um, and then she moved over to be on Teleround and was giving a talk there twice in the meantime. Oh. Uh, and the other way around obviously as well. So um, I think there is, the interest is growing and, and, and accessibility got more visible which is really, really important. Um, then what I'm uh, really experiencing is that especially the younger generations, also designers, but also developers, they are really interested in what's going on there. And um, they are also taking part in these, okay. these kind of events. So this is really, this is, I'm, I'm seeing growing interest in that area actually. And what I, what, what's really helpful in, Ger in Germany and in Europe uh, as well, in general, is uh, what you already mentioned, uh, that there are um, legal things going on and that people must um, do accessible stuff in the meantime. So um, that's really helpful because otherwise I think you know, we d wouldn't see any progress or we wouldn't see that progress we're seeing in the moment. And it will take a little bit more time to... Um, to really land um, accessibility in Germany. I think the European Accessibility Act is really important in that in that sense. That's true. So, Josh, when you are you know, um, talking within your community, talking with people that out that are outside your, your network working on accessibility, um, uh, what what type of feeling do you get from people when you are talking about accessibility? Do they say, "Oh, wow, this is something"? completely new for me, or they feel, well, yeah, this is something I really need to do. Do you feel the need to explain yourself too much or people really go and understand and see it and, and understand the importance? Hmm, it's also a very good question. I, um, you said, if, if I'm talking with people outside of like the accessibility community. The problem is I'm mostly inside. I'm, I'm, I'm really rarely talking to someone outside of this bubble. So um, with like with my team and with my agency, we are trying to, um, we used to work mostly for like uh, public authorities and uh, people who really um, need to do accessible stuff. But at the moment we try to um, move back again to like um, other industries which are not public actually and we would really like to carry accessibility topics into that uh, into that area but when we talk to people there then it's mostly uh, some like companies who are in some way connected with topics like sustainability or um, or like other 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 stuff which kind of really goes well together with accessibility so when we are talking about accessibility topics with them they mostly already know what i'm talking about um, they they mostly didn't uh, really work on accessibility um, but they at, at least it's it's rather easy to get them um, on board and i i think they're, they're, the, the majority of, of, um, of industries probably still has no idea what accessibility is. And I think there is a lot of, um, yeah, I, yeah, a lot of, you really need to convince them and you really need to explain what accessibility is and why it's important. So um, I think it's not really common yet to know what accessibility is about, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, you, you, start, you, you mentioned before that you no longer own a car. That's true. Yeah. So, uh, and we know that Germany has a long tradition of public transport, and there's a lot of investment on that. Can you give us, you know, uh, not, I know that's not our area, but can you give us a little bit of a glimpse? How is that in terms of accessibility? You know, you know, can people really move, or they need to struggle? They need to. It's quite. It's it's, it's uh, just the fact that you want to travel. It becomes a burn. And, and you find it difficult. Uh, how, how do you see the, the mobility area in terms of accessibility? 
I think this is a difficult topic and I'm I'm not super into that, but I'm trying to give you an, uh, what, what at least I got, got notice of. Um, I think there are two different perspectives on the on the mobility community in, in Germany in general. That is, I, I experience a lot of um, people living abroad coming to Germany and uh, and, and, and thinking that uh, the public transport systems are really, really good. That's at, at least what they tell me. Um, from the inside of Germany, people are really angry with the public uh, transport system and think it's really bad. So there is like two perspectives on that in general, um, especially um, among my friends uh, with disabilities. I think uh, there is a lot of complaints about the public transport system because, yeah. uh, for example, the German uh, Bahn, which is like the main uh, company there, just ordered a couple of new trains and they are all not accessible. And uh, people are asking, how, how can that be? Like in 2022, how can uh, it, because it's a public, uh, it, it's it's a, um, it's owned by the state. So how can that be that they uh, buy inaccessible trains? Um, that was just right now. I was reading some tweets uh, the other day. So that's, that's um, surprising. I have to say, um, yes, because, you know, public so, procurement so. has been. Know, doing accessibility for, for a long time and you would have thought that they would have continued to, to, to do this. Was this for the ICE or was it for, yeah? I, I think so, yes. I mean, as I said, I'm not really into that, but I'm reading all these complaints on Twitter and uh, in my bubble because uh, because this is obviously, this is really embarrassing, right? It shouldn't happen. Um, yeah. And I know this. There is this uh, this friend of mine. Uh, he's an activist in Germany. He's, he's using a wheelchair. Uh, you might know him. He's also the the guy uh, who started this uh, ableism uh, project uh, we were talking about earlier. And he uh, he he's actually he's the inventor of Wheelmap. I don't know if you uh, if you know that yeah, one. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, so and and he he's also he's one of these people who are really complaining loudly about uh, the, such things. And he also uh, started a couple of projects around public transport and uh, especially accessibility of, for example, elevators at, uh, at train stations because uh, that's also part of the uh, transport system. And uh, he 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 was really he's really famous for writing a story about one of his journeys with a public transport where he just could he was just left somewhere on the countryside and he couldn't travel on because uh, there was kind of uh, no elevator from from the train station to get out of there and there was no train to get get away from there so it was really it was yeah. really famous so, so that's that's a scandal yeah yeah I, I think it's it's not uncommon um, we, we know that journeys for people with physical access needs in, in the UK take significantly longer, uh, have a lot greater complexity, because if you're using public transport, not all of the stations are accessible. Some of that is due to legacy, and we built our, our underground railways over a century ago. The latest one, which opened actually a couple of days ago, is accessible and it has you know, larger trains and I'm sure people will find fault, but uh, at least this time around they're, they're planning to make it better. But but I do think that the the challenges of, of sort of using public transport are, are quite often underestimated and and it's not just the whether or not the station is accessible quite often the infrastructure breaks down and people don't get notified so like your friend then you end up stranded so so mm -hmm. the whole bunch of work that can be done with smart cities and in that kind of technology space where just by provision of better information you can provide a, a, a better quality of service now i know deborah had a different question so I'll well, no, no, I totally agree with what you're saying. And I was just going to pick up on the topic that Yoshi was talking about, about ableism, because I know besides doing the Accessibility Club, you also, your team is, I'm looking at my notes to say it right, your team has been involved in 
Ability Watch and also the hashtag ableism killing, which is a scary uh, hashtag. But I was just wondering if, because uh, I have heard of this gentleman in Germany and he's doing amazing things. And so we'd love to have him on the show, Josie. It, you, you should introduce us to him. But, you know, the, the other part that you're doing is, um, well, it's sort of like you said, when you were doing it, you thought maybe you'd get like two or three so can you tell us more about that? Because that's a really powerful uh, project that you've been working on as well. Okay, I'm going to try my best. Um, never thought about this in, in English words. Oh, um, sorry. There have, no worries, I'm, try, I'm trying my best. Um, there was this, uh, on April 28th last year, there has been a case in Germany, in Potsdam, where... Um, a woman working in some sort of, um, how do you call that in English? A um, nursing home. Uh, yeah, kind of. Kind of so, yeah. Something, yeah, something like that. And this person working there uh, killed four people with disability and, um, and, and really seriously injured a fifth one. And this was like, uh, it got in the media and there was like a lot of people were uh, really, and it kind of disappeared from the media uh, rather quickly. Oh. And so my friend Raul, um, he, he and obviously not he, him alone, but there's a couple of people around him, all the people from Ability Watch, which, which is like they, they are a couple of people complaining about stuff like that. They mm -hmm. wanted to do something about this um, and they wanted to make it visible that there is, uh, there is a real problem and it's not like one case. Uh, there are probably more cases, and it's going for for lots of years already. And this is kind of a kind of a systemic problem. Um, and he wanted to do something because he's a, he's a political activist, and he wanted to do something about this and wanted to make it visible. So um, he found like a couple of other people, and then he called me and asked me if I would support them if we would support them with a website um, to make this visible. And uh, I said, uh, yes, sure, because this is an important topic. And I'm, I'm not, I'm, I must admit, I'm not too much into that ableism stuff. Um, at least I wasn't at that point. Uh, but I said, obviously, I will support this because it's an important project. We, we uh, do some pro bono projects. Uh, once in a while, if, if we can afford. So that was something, because there was no money in that. So right. um, we, we just said, I, we, we're going to support this. It's going to be a quick and easy website. Okay. And uh, Raul was, uh, he, he was kind of thinking aloud and he was like, maybe we should do something like a single pager and we could like collect three or five cases, maybe. Not sure how many we will find. Um, and it, it, you know, it doesn't have to be rocket science, but it should, it should look quite okay-ish so that I can go and and uh, and be loud about that and uh, go to the politicians and and stuff like that so uh, I said I'm going to support him and then we started working on that and it it quickly there grew a, a big team of people and there were people from all over Germany and even abroad um, starting to do some research on these cases and um, it it grew and grew and then there, there was a project manager and there was couple of people doing this research and they found so many cases they found hundreds of cases over the last 20 30 years and it was really i mean in the end we were a team of almost 40 people i think um obviously a couple of uh, my my colleagues here at tovak uh, helped building the website but still we we were like three or four people of 40 or something uh, we even had uh, in this team, there were even coaches for the people doing the research because it was so depressing to do the okay. research on that. Um, so um, we actually wanted to launch this in September and then it got November and then it was end of the year. And finally, because the project grew bigger and bigger and uh, it took so much time. And in the end, uh, we launched it at the one year anniversary of that case in Potsdam back, uh, back in 2021. Um, and... Actually, I think next week will be the first team meeting after the launch, and uh, we will get feedback about what was the um, like the feedback uh, on the whole project. Because obviously, I'm going to see all the all the public media stuff about it, but I didn't really uh, hear about uh, what was the personal feedback. 
uh, we got so far. So this is going to be interesting. And I know that there's going to happen a lot more in that. I think it was a success, like the project was a success. Obviously, it's a very depressing topic. Um, right, but it's an important topic that we need to talk about. And I, true. It, it, it's a fa I love the website. You did a fabulous job. Very easy Thank to you. navigate. The topic's really hard, but I think, you know, just because a topic is is chilling to go into doesn't mean we don't go in and explore it. And I know here in the States, every single one of our states has a disability center that you can report abuse to. Here in Virginia, for example, we have the Disability Law Center. They get so many complaints. And I have a daughter, Josie, that is 35 years old with Down syndrome. And she actually was in a supported, uh, excuse me, a supported apartment living situation during part of the pandemic and before that. And some really unfortunate bad things came down. She now is back at home with me where she's safe. And the group that was working with her actually filed, they did an investigation internally and found that well, this is what they said. They had violated her uh, civil rights. And, um, and, and I'll be honest with you, it was accidental. They did not mean to do it, but still my daughter suffered the consequences. And to date, even though she's now been home with me for over a year because she came home last May. Now, of course, my husband and her father died in the middle of this and that didn't help, but she will not sleep with the lights off. She was so traumatized by what happened to her. And um, yeah, that I didn't like that, but it's so important in that we do talk about these things. They cannot be hidden in the darkness. But I would also wonder if you're getting funding now because this work should continue. And what would be wonderful is what we're supposed to do here in the States. When they get these complaints, they're supposed to investigate it. But there are sadly so many complaints, they can only investigate the worst, the most grievous ones. And that's a really very sad as well. Go ahead, Yoshi. Uh, you asked about the funding, and I'm pretty sure there will be funding. Good, um, good. Uh, part of the problem is that... Um, that's that's a crazy situation. And this is what we we were talking about earlier uh, before we launched the project. Um, part of the funding um, now comes from the organizations who actually uh, run uh, the the nursing homes and stuff because they, oh. yeah, not 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 just to yeah. I mean because they have actually they, they you know they do they as you said it, it's some something happens and it's probably accidental in in, in in general they want to do good stuff and uh, they really want to to eliminate this problem as well but um so it, it's kind of a kind of a difficult situation for them because uh, they don't want these cases to happen obviously right um because they're ch charity organizations and stuff so, but so um, it's 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 kind of difficult, and uh, there is there there will definitely be funding. At least this is what I expect, because um, I you know this is the part of the project that's it's not not actually my part. We just did the website, kind of. You know, uh, right. I'm not I'm not the political activist in that case. Right. So. Um, I think some it. corporate brands. We you have some powerful German corporate brands that are working on accessibility, including us. And so I'd love to see some of the corporate brands step in and help too. Um, but I think that's such a good point that you brought up that sort of the nursing homes, the, the assist, we call them here, uh, assistive living, uh, memory care. You know, we, but I, I also wanted to just note, cause as you were talking, I thought of this and then I'm gonna pass it back to Neil, but my mother who is now deceased as well, but my mother went into a nursing home and, um, she had gotten really sick because she fell and everything, but she went in the nursing home and like a week later, and, and I was in Virginia, she was in Florida. They called me and told me she was in the emergency room, something had gone on with her heart. And I was, I, I was so shocked because that was not what was wrong, but we rushed in and, but, and they, we, my mom was very ill. She almost died. They, at the last minute, they figured something out. Her lungs were filling up with water and the doctor found an antibiotic that stopped it. Well, what wound up happening after it was all said and done was the nursing home didn't know what had happened to my mother, but did not tell us, even though it would have saved her life, even though luckily the doctor. So they had Legionnaire's disease because the apartments had sat so long for years and they forgot to run the water and they had Legionnaire's disease in these nursing homes and they knew it. 
some other residents had gotten, almost killed my mother, did kill a few women. And so we sued him because, you know, we are the United States. And I think people should be sued when they do stuff like that. They hit it. So that I have no patience with. If it's an accident, let's work together. Let's improve processes. But I just wanted to say that one comment too. And Neil, I know you want to make a comment. And Josh, oh, yeah. let me turn it over to you if you want to comment too. Oh, I just sh shocked by the story. Uh, I think that the the thing that was interesting was we had Andy Imperato on not that, a while back now, about a year ago, and and his uh, disability rights lawyer um but essentially they are paid by the state to sue the state uh so it's a very similar sort of situation you know the state knows that it needs to be held accountable yeah so it's disability rights california so um um and so they pay drc to do the work of holding them to account so so i think that it's a model that does work um, because you, ca you can't really police yourselves. You know, we know that self-policing doesn't work very well in industry. So it, it's good to see, um, see that happening. Um, and, and really important work that you've been doing. Um, we're pretty much on at the end of our time. So I'd like to thank you very much for, for joining us today and really looking forward to a, a very uh, vibrant Twitter chat. I need to thank my clear text for keeping us captioned. And it's good to be back. Thank you for having me. It was fun. We've missed Neil and Joshi. We love your work. And we our entire community wants to get behind what you're doing. So I'm so glad that you're on Access Chat today. Thank you so much for your work. Thank you.